so good to have the Binghams with us today. They were heading out to India just as I was arriving, so God leads us to different places, but just great reports. I encourage you to check out the launch there, and the Salsas are here. Also, James came up from Portland as well, drove up today, so welcome, James. I'm not sure where are you sitting, James. Uh, right over here. All right, let's just stand up one second, and James, another of our international partners too, so... <clears throat> We love our international partners. It's such an honor for all of us to be partnering with them and connected in what God's doing all around the world. Have you enjoyed the uh, sunshine last week or two? So it's true, Seattle does have more than one season. And uh, I'm so glad, it's wonderful. But I, I enjoy the rain actually and the sunshine. Let's uh, go ahead and pray together. And uh, we're starting second week in this new series, Reimagine. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for what you're doing right here in our church, in our hearts, and then what you're doing around the world, and that we get to be a part of it. And God, thank you for your word that is truth, that is dependable, that is life-giving, that brings hope and a new perspective. And we pray today we would just rest and trust and soak in your word as we draw close to you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I was driving home and approaching an intersection where there was a red light, and I did stop. Uh, two lanes that could turn to the right. I was in the left-hand lane. And when the stoplight did turn green, the car in front of me didn't move. Now, all the cars in the right-hand lane started to turn right, but the car in front of me didn't move. And as I looked forward, you know, the woman had uh, entered into the intersection to a point where she couldn't see the stoplight above. So it was green, but she was stopped. And all the cars were moving to her right, but she was looking to her left. And she was waiting and wondering, are more cars coming and waiting and trying to, you know, the sun was shining, trying to look past the sun and inching a little forward and waiting some more and waiting. So I started honking obnoxiously. <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. Self-control, right? Uh, so I just waited. I wouldn't interrupt her when she's creating a sermon illustration besides. So, I mean, this is wonderful. But, but it, it made me think sometimes how God's perspective is different than our perspective. And that God sees everything and we only see a little bit. It also reminded me that our perspective is so powerful. Our perspective shapes the way that we respond and we act and we handle different situations. So our perspective goes under the radar, but it's so significant. And today in this Reimagine series, we're going to be talking about elevating your perspective, a new perspective, which is really finding God's perspective. And when we talk about the word perspective, many pieces to a perspective, but I'm going to highlight three components that I think are important. And the first one is your thinking. My thinking, your thinking, what we're doing with our mind is crucial as it relates to our perspective. So let's turn to Exodus chapter 18. Genesis and then Exodus as you open up your Bible. If you need a Bible, we'll be glad to give you or help you find a Bible as well. Uh, but we're in Exodus chapter 18 and it's the life of Moses. Look at verse 7. Moses is about to have a guest. An in-law is coming over. Any in-laws coming over to your house coming up? Uh, how does that go? Well, for Moses, it works out pretty well. Uh, let's start in verse 7. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. Is that how you greet your father-in-law? <laughs> Mine's coming in a couple of weeks, so if this is biblical, I need to pay attention to this, but I, I don't expect that to happen. Um, they greeted each other, and then they went into the tent. Now, verse 10, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, said, Praise be to the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh, and who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. That's right, give praise to the Lord, not to Moses. Uh, Jethro's a wise man. Now drop down to verse 3. This is where it gets interesting. A lot of blessings are happening, but here's one thing that's not quite right. The next day Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning until evening. And then in verse 17, Moses' father-in-law replied, What you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me and I will give you some advice. And may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. 
Teach them the decrees and laws and show them the way to live and the duties they are to perform. But select capable men from among all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy men, who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. And he concludes in verse 23, if you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. So uh, from morning to evening, what did Moses do all day long? Listened to people's disputes and complaining and grumbling. Does that sound fun? (laughs) Anyone signing up for that job description? And so uh, this is not good, Jethro says. Here's three reasons why it's not good. Moses, you're going to be so worn out. Anyone here ever get burned out from doing too much? And then secondly, Moses, people are going to get tired out because they're waiting all day to get in line to meet with you. And third, Moses, you're neglecting the most important things. Do you ever get caught up in what appears to be urgent and then neglect what's actually most important in life? So Jethro is laying this out very um, clear. And to Moses' credit, he's well-intentioned, he's caring, he's kind, He wants to help people. You can be very well-intentioned and end up off track. And you know what the Christian thing to do is when you're well-intentioned but you end up off track? You need to be able to say, this is not working. Some Christians are reluctant to say that. They just think, well, I should just be content. I should just be happy at all times. I should just do... No, sometimes we need to say, this is not working, and that's the start of when we open up to what God has that's so much better. And that's when change or healing can come. So Jethro helps Moses to realize this is not working. Uh, There was one thought Moses had that was so destructive. I need to do everything. No one can help me. Have you ever believed that thought? I need to do everything. No one can help me. I'm going to do more and more and more. Okay, Martha. (laughs) Isn't that Jesus talking to Martha and saying, look at Mary. She's not trying to do everything. She's drawing close to me. And so we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. Here's the principle. Your vision is too small if you are not getting other people involved. Your vision's too small when you don't get other people involved. God highlights that principle throughout Scripture. Jesus, he demonstrated that for us over and over again, getting more people involved, more people involved. Here comes the three, here comes the 12, here comes the 72. It's just more people involved. So Jethro comes up with a better plan. And it's my philosophy in leadership that the better plan should always prevail. Sometimes big shots, you know, in corporations, you know, they're not open to the better plan because they're in charge and they're going to do it their way. The better plan, wherever it comes from, if your in-law has a better plan, bless your in-laws. And uh, then you implement the better plan. So they implement the better plan in that one destructive thought that Moses had. I have to do everything. That was a destructive thought. And Ralph Waldo Emerson said, as a man thinks... All during the day, that's what he becomes. So one little thought for Moses, I have to do everything, that's what he becomes. Burned out, and the people are frustrated. Jim Burns added, by the way, that our thoughts are so powerful. There's a story of a man who got locked into a refrigerated unit. It was an accident, and he got locked in, and he just assumed my body can't hold with this temperature, and he wrote out a note, you know, that he was um, going to die, and uh, the next morning he did die. And when they studied his body, they said there's no way the temperatures were like about 50 degrees. There's no way he died from the temperatures. But he assumed and thought he would die, and so that played in. Again, um, some mystery there, but our thoughts are so po- What we believe, the scripture says, is so important. What do you believe? and then how does that play out in your life so new thoughts Jethro gives Moses God's thoughts it's this set up higher courts and lower courts great system find trustworthy capable reliable leaders who fear God great idea Moses focus on two things the most important cases in teaching people the word of the Lord that's where you stay put Moses that's the sweet zone and so Moses is taking all of this in and uh, I think this is relevant to every church 
You know why? Because one thing that happens in churches is that people get a sense of gifts and call and they're passionate to serve the Lord and they end up in a position where they're trying to do too much. And they're doing things that are not the very best things. They're doing things that are good things. And then because they're overdoing it, then you got a whole bunch of people just sitting around like, oh, there's no place for me. I guess my gifts don't do anything here. And so in churches, what happens a lot of times is you see a lot of people sitting on the sidelines thinking there's no opportunity for me here. And then the other people just getting burned out. And this passage speaks to that. And so... Um, my, you know, I say it all the time to staff is that we together need to encourage each other, equip each other, give each other opportunities, and spur each other on so that we do it together. As far as grace will go in carrying out the vision God has for us, I'm convinced it's going to be together. And the more people that get involved and find their sweet spot and their niche, the more that the kingdom is going to be built up. And that's an awesome picture. So this trap right here, again, it gets back to the thinking that we have as far as ministry, following God, and our roles. Here's the, the principle. Healthy thinking continually identifies and incorporates what God is thinking. Classic passage in Matthew chapter uh, 16. Jesus explains to Peter, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, and then risen to life. And Peter steps in and says, never, Lord. You're not going to die on that cross. And Peter then, and people are familiar with this statement, then Peter hears from Jesus, get behind me, Satan. And a lot of people stop reading there. But you know what the next verse says? Peter, you are a stumbling block to me. Peter's got this grand idea that Jesus would not go to the cross. <laughs> and, and Jesus steps in and says, you're a stumbling block to me because, Peter, you have in mind not the things of God, but you have in mind the things of man. <laughs> and Jesus lays out this distinction. You can either have the thoughts of man or the thoughts of God. Um, what is a culture? It's a people's ways and a people's thoughts. But what is God's word? God's ways and God's thoughts. See, a lot of people kind of wonder, well, how can I get more of God's thoughts into this little cranium right here? And that is where change happens in our life. And so here at Grace, here, you know, Sunday mornings, every classroom, every age group, we are focused on God's word. We have life groups all throughout the week to help in community get into God's word. Daily, we send out videos and devotions to help get into God's word because this is, God pours in his thoughts, his ways, his priorities right here. It's, it's not like, oh, how would I ever know? God has written it down and passed it on. It's so clear. So the more we take in, the more our minds change. Where does transformation happen? right in the mind, right between the ears. You know, where's the target? Where's the bullseye? Right between the ears. Romans 12, verse 2. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, man's thoughts, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you will know God's, and you'll approve and see God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. Can I tell you a practical thing that helps so much with our thoughts? It's just one verse, Philippians chapter four, verse eight. Whatever is true, noble, right, excellent, uh, praiseworthy, um, think about these things. Think about these things. We make choices all day long with our thoughts. And to take just one of God's thoughts and replace it with one destructive thought. That's what Jethro helped Moses do. Find one destructive thought that you're holding on to. I can never be forgiven. God would never use me. I'm not lovable. Take that one destructive thought, remove it, put in God's thought. Do you know what Satan tries to do? Satan tries to twist, put a lie in there, put something that's not right. You know what God, uh, God's word, Jesus, when he's talking to Satan, Jesus is quoting scripture. Here's God's word. Here's God's word. Here's God's word. So sum it up. When it comes to our thoughts, we can't control that first thought that pops in there, all right? Thoughts are just flying all the time, right? But there's two things we decide with our thoughts, and it's this. Number one, what do you dwell on? And number two, what do you believe? 
What do you believe and what do you dwell on? And Jesus says there's man's thoughts and there's God's thoughts. And Moses replacing one of the destructive thoughts is going to change the entire community. It's powerful when you think about perspective and your thoughts. So there's a start. That's one area. I said there's three areas today. And uh, the second area relating to our perspective is your feelings. And for this, let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter 10. 2 Samuel chapter 10, and I'm going to read through uh, this story, kind of tucked away in this book, but uh, so telling, so insightful into relationships and feelings. So verse 1, in the course of time, the king of the Ammonites died, and his son Hanan succeeded him as king. David thought, I will show kindness to Hanan, son of Nahash, just as his father showed kindness to me. So David sent a delegation to express his sympathy to Hanan concerning his father. Everyone understanding so far? Nahash, the king, has died. Hanan's the new king. David sending over some delegates to, uh, to show sympathy. Now look, when David's men came to the land of the Ammonites, the Ammonite nobles said to Hanan their lord, Do you think... That David is honoring your father by sending men to you to express sympathy? Hasn't David sent them to you to explore the city and spy it out and overthrow it? So Hanan seized David's men, shaved off half of each man's beard, and cut off their garments at the middle of the gluteus maximus and, um, and, and sent them away. That's a specific biological term. I think it's... Uh, Maybe in the Latin. Um, when David was told about this, he sent messengers to meet the men, for they were greatly humiliated. And then the king said, Stay at Jericho till your beards have grown, and then come back. Now, when the Ammonites realized that they had become a stench in David's nostrils, they hired 20,000 Aramean foot soldiers from Beth Rehob and Zobah as well as the king of Makkah with a thousand men and also 12,000 men from Tob. And on hearing this, David sent Joab out with the entire army of fighting men. So, the Ammonites, if you're in Jerusalem, this is uh, the neighbors to the east. And there's the Ammonites, and for a long time there was a good relationship. Nahash was the king. Now Nahash died, and Hanan is the new king. So, uh, with that, David's going to send a delegation, kindness, sympathy. How do they take it? Assumptions are so important in life, right? <laughs> I mean, what's actually happening here? What's perceived to be happening here? And so here comes, you know, gifts, sympathy, kindness. But instead, I would just say it's a very emotional time for Hanan. Imagine if your dad just died, right? So there's a lot of sadness, don't hear that feelings are bad. Feelings aren't bad. Sadness is part of our mourning. You're not less spiritual when you're sad. So there should be sadness. Dad has died. There should be some mourning as well. But now feelings start to drift into fear. And they say, this feels like espionage. This feels like spies who want to kill us. And fear starts to build. So there's sadness. There's maybe some anger. There's fear involved. And all this is building up. And it leads to the question, how do you manage your feelings? What's your approach? How do your feelings relate to your perspective? Here's three things I think that are helpful in managing our feelings. The first one is to look at a fact check and say, what is really true? <laughs> Have you ever been worked up over something and then you found out later, oh, you didn't even need to be worked up at all? <laughs> like all that was based on something that wasn't even true. So do a fact check and see, okay, what's actually true here? The second thing, say, okay, is this an appropriate level? Is this an appropriate level? Have you been around people who get huge reactions over little things? And so that ability to say, is this an appropriate level for the reaction that I'm bringing and the feelings that I'm bringing? And then the third piece is this, okay, how should I respond in a positive way? Whenever there's an intense wave of feelings, we have a lot of options in how we want to respond. So what would be a positive response to this feeling? The Bible says, in your anger, do not sin. Um, this is something, what I just described, that is lifelong. 
And you know, at our stage in parenting right now, uh, with our kids, I would say it's relevant in my life. It's relevant in people's lives that are older than me. Uh, it's relevant in our kids' lives. You know what we're trying to do with our kids right now? Our kids are five, six, seven, and nine. Kind of, kind of feels like quadruplets a lot of days. Uh, and so with our kids, we try to walk them through this. How do you feel? Okay, um, so, so they can just start to describe. I feel angry. I feel sad. Okay, very good. Now, what did you just do? What did you just say? What are some other options? What could you have said? How could you handle that feeling? And trying to get kids to like stop, recognize how they're feeling, think about their options, and then choose something positive is massive in their development. And it's really big in marriage. And it's really big in families to be able to have that skill, a little bit of self-regulation, let the Holy Spirit lead you through those emotions, and, uh, and then how those affect relationships. So here's a principle. Wisdom includes calming down before making big decisions and statements. Wisdom includes calming down before you hit the send button. Before you hit the post button, uh, maybe running it by a loved one, maybe sleeping on it, maybe praying on it. Uh, take a little pause, take a break. If it's really heated, take a step back because our emotions want to master us and sometimes our emotions will thrust us into decisions that we'll realize later we're not wise, we had lost some perspective. Um, and that's good, you know, with big decisions like, do I take this job? Do I say yes to this role? Do I buy this house? It's also very important in relational decisions and the impact that can happen there. So what could Hanan, what could he have done differently? He could have asked David some questions. <laughs> I mean, in the middle of big emotions and a big reaction, sometimes the best thing to do is just ask a couple questions to David. Hey, why are these guys coming? He could have set up a treaty. Uh, he could have said, I'm so sorry, David. <laughs> it's an emotional time. My dad just died. I had some fears running there. I know if you shave half the beard of an Israelite, you're asking for some trouble. Uh, if you intentionally bring some wardrobe malfunctions and send the guys back, you're asking for some trouble. Hanan could have just said, I'm sorry. It was a great moment to just say, I'm sorry, I got emotional, I lost perspective, I blew it, but he didn't. What does he do? Get three more kingdoms involved and 33,000 more soldiers involved. And it just escalates. Here's the principle. Prevent unnecessary escalation by noticing the reactions you are causing. I notice when I shave half the beard on all David's men, they take that as it's time to battle, it's time to fight. You know, notice that, Hanan, notice that. Uh, you know what happens in marriage and some friendships, you get into a pattern where a wise spouse says, oh, if I'm gonna do that, then my spouse is gonna do that, and the result is that we're gonna be much further apart. Uh, so we have habits where we're just like, I want to win. Well, if I want to win that argument, what's that going to do to the other person? And how does that affect our relationship? How do things affect your coworker? How do things affect your family, your neighbors? See, a wise person recognizes their tone, their comments, the drama they bring, how it affects the other person and they're paying attention to that and it's not that you have to please everybody but you become wise when you don't need to escalate and here's the piece that happens a lot of times someone wrongs you over here and you walk over there full of emotion and take it out on someone over here seen that one played out in life <laughs> someone wrongs someone over here and who pays the price right over there and they're like, what just happened? Well, somebody didn't manage their emotions over here when they were wronged. And so they just took it out on someone over there. Our emotions and our perspective. Uh, the Ammonites, they lose a lot of lives and they stop. You know what happens in verse 15? The Arameans, now, they say, oh, okay, we're fighting 
They go beyond the Euphrates. They call in 40,000 more soldiers and 40,000 die. Over what? (laughs) Over what? Was it worth it? David sent some men in sympathy and because emotions and everything was spinning out of control, it just escalated and escalated and 40,000 people have now died. And methinks it's time to regain perspective. Um, Feelings, God's wired us with feelings. It's not bad. Getting older, again, I'm only 45, but I noticed my body's changing. All right? Uh, Getting older, I have friends who are, you know, almost twice my age say, getting older is not for wimps. (laughs) Uh, Getting older, sometimes you notice your body hurts in new ways, didn't. You're not able to do what you used to do. Sometimes when I'm in sports, my brain's telling me I'm still 25. (laughs) And my body's saying, uh, check your driver's license. It's uh, 45 now. And, And so there's, you know, but as you get older and then there's aches and pains and, you know, different things that happen to our bodies as we get older. And does any of that feel good? No. It reminds us we're getting new bodies in heaven. It reminds us we're one day closer to glory. And this is just temporary. But this is what I've seen. Some people, as they get older, get more grumpy. No names, no specific people in mind. And other people, they are so grateful. Same feelings. Body doesn't work how it used to work. Some people get grumpy and complain, and there they go. They're in, that's their crowd. And other people just are grateful, soaking up the blessings, getting closer to glory, passing on their wisdom, new opportunities. What a difference in how they're handling the feelings and how they're walking through life. When the feelings swell and there's a wave of intense feelings, here's two questions to just go deeper than the feelings. Number one, am I listening to God? In the middle of these feelings, am I listening to God? And here's the second one, am I trusting God? Am I trusting God? You go back to those two questions. Hit a pause when you need to, hit a break when you need to. But stop and say, am I really trusting God? Because if that one isn't sorted out, the feelings want to rule and master and will take you down some crazy roads. But you say, if I'm listening to God and I'm trusting God, he's going to walk me through these feelings and managing them and talking about them and how they relate to my perspective. And that's one way. God renews our thinking. God helps us, guide us through the most intense feelings and walks us through in wisdom. So two things. Here's the third area, and this is uh, our faith, a third component to our perspective, and this is our faith. So look at the book of Numbers, fourth book in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and there's this classic passage, and uh, I go back to this passage often, I think, because I, I see it played out so often in different contexts. And uh, Numbers chapter 13, start with uh, the story here in verse 17. Moses is leading the people. God's told them the promised land is yours. And now Moses sends up, here they go, some spies to explore Canaan. That's the promised land. He said, go up through the Negev and on into the hill country. See what, you know, this promised land is like. And whether the people who live there, they're strong or they're weak, whether they're few or many, what kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? And so verse 28, the spies now come back. And a big group of the spies, 10 of the 12 spies, they, they say this, the people who live there are powerful. Their cities are fortified. Their cities are very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. You could just hear again uh, the lack of faith. And then verse 30 <clears throat> Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. In verse 32, the the 10, it says, they spread among the two million Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. And they said this, we saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. 
we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Uh, there's a principle. Believe God for what he has already given you. God, in his word, gives you so much if you want it, but he gives it to you. He's already given it to you. It's right there for the taking. That was the situation for the promised land. God had already given it to them, but 10 of the spies looked at it and they said, the people are big, the cities are big, the walls are big, and we are just like little grasshoppers. There's no way God's word is true and we can believe him. Uh, Two different viewpoints in this passage. I think of Mark chapter 9, verse 24, where there's a dad who has a boy who's demon-possessed, and he's struggling with doubts and unbelief. And he said, Lord Jesus, you know, I'm not sure you can heal. And Jesus is like, you're not sure I can heal? And, and then the man says, no, no, no. I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. And he's just honest about his lack of faith. Then on the flip side, when Jesus returns to his hometown, there's no honor for him in his hometown. And it says he can only do a couple miracles there, healing only a couple people because of the lack of faith. And the Bible even says Jesus was amazed at the lack of faith. Jesus is not you know, amazed <laughs> that many times, but he was amazed at their lack of faith. When Peter steps out of the boat and wants to walk on the water, faith is... He's walking on water. Peter gets a few steps in and then sees the storm, fear, and he sinks. And it's the classic with all of us, faith and fear, belief, unbelief. Caleb and Joshua are saying, yes, we believe God's word and what he says and what he's giving to us. And 10 then spread a bad report to 2 million saying, ah, no, we're scared. We're going with fear and doubts and unbelief. And so all of us in the different situations in life, you know, the opposite of faith a lot of times is fear. And fear wants to do two things. Wants to discourage you and the discouragement says, you can't do it, you're just a grasshopper. <laughs> That's what fear wants to do. And then deceive you, deceive you. Well, God's word isn't true. God's promise doesn't stand. You could never have this. You could never have the promised land. You'll never get there. So here's, here's the challenge. Be an underdog who experiences the joy of wholeheartedly carrying out God's work. Step into that role like Joshua and Caleb of being an underdog who's going to experience the joy. Why? Because they're wholeheartedly following God. In Numbers chapter 14, 24, God says, Joshua and Caleb, they have a different spirit about them. They have a different faith. They wholeheartedly follow me where you can't say that about the other ones. And I look throughout the Bible. You know what God loves to do? He loves to find underdogs who will fully trust him. He likes to find Gideon and tell Gideon, you're actually a warrior. And Gideon's like, no, I'm a grasshopper. Uh, I mean, my family, oh, they're a mess. I'm the least in my family. Like, I'm never a warrior. So you're a warrior, Gideon. And he likes to take 300 underdogs with Gideon and just win battles. Jesus likes to take fishermen. He's like, what do you guys know about theology? Well, um, I, we like to fish. Perfect. Let's go change the world. Uh, you know, he, he likes to take people who have in their resume, like they, they've actually murdered other people. And, and you know, like Moses and, and Paul and these violent guys and say, okay, by my grace, it's time to be an underdog for me and let's go for this thing. And you just see that pattern throughout Scripture. Those who are maybe weak or have made mistakes or, you know, insecure and all this, God comes along and says, you are my choice. You're my underdog to get this done. And then it comes down to our faith. And what do we believe in terms of what God wants to give us and use us? And so when we look at this example, at Joshua and, and again with um, Caleb, I see these two groups of people compared to the other ten spies. And, and I want to say this. If you're someone who tends to be pessimistic and you show up in the room and the first three things you see without even trying are the things that are wrong and off. Uh, and you're just kind of wired, you know, the glass is half empty. And that's kind of just your wiring. Um, sometimes your critical thinking is going to be helpful. But I want to say this, be careful, because there's a lot of people with a lack of faith who just say, well, I'm just realistic. 
these 10 spies, well, I'm just realistic. The cities are big. The people are big. You know, uh, they're like giants. We're like grasshoppers. I'm just being realistic. Well, that's not being realistic. <laughs> that's a lack of faith. And it's easy to just go into negative doubts, pessimism, and say, well, I'm just the only realistic one in the room, uh, the 10 of us. Say, well, actually, it's a lack of faith right there. And then if you're someone who, um, you know, just every day, lunch is great, your shirt's great, <laughs> the weather's great. I mean, everything is just awesome. You know what the word is there. The, the word there is, um, you know, sometimes you need to be able to say, this is not working. You're stuffing a lot of things. You're not being honest with God. And like Moses, you're trying to do everything. <laughs> People are optimistic sometimes. They're the ones that get burned out because they just think, oh, I can change the whole world. I can change my husband. I can change my wife. I can change the community. I can change everything. And, and it's just like, um, okay, well, what does God actually want you to do? <laughs> and, and is this your way or God's way? And your timing or God's timing? And so, you know, both are a gift. People are optimistic or, you know, have a lot of times full of faith. They spur other people on. And we need both in the body, but there's a danger with both wirings. And, and so how does this tie in to the faith? Um, I want us to just step back and, and ask this question, like, what do you bring when it comes to faith? What do you bring into the place you live, into your family. What do you bring? What do you bring into your life group? What do you bring into the church? What do you bring into the community? What kind of faith are you bringing into all those different places? Because folks, there are different cultures of faith in different environments of faith. And what happens, kind of like Jesus when he saw his hometown, there was a culture and environment of unbelief. These 10 created a culture of unbelief and a lack of faith. Joshua and Caleb, a culture of faith. There's different cultures. What you bring is really important. What's the culture where you live in your family? When it comes to faith, what's the culture? What do you bring? What do you bring? These stories in the Bible, they're not just stories to learn about. Oh, Joshua and Caleb. They relate to our lives. What do you bring to the church? What do you bring to the life group? And I'm not saying you have to have it all together. That's not the picture. But are you wholeheartedly an underdog for God that's ready to receive what God has and believe his word? Or are there other things going on, some things to get right with the Lord? And so you add these three, our thinking, our feelings, our faith. They shape a perspective. And we all bring perspectives to life. And uh, I'm going to close with two stories because I think these perspectives are true in the small things of life and the big things. And uh, here's the small thing. I like to play soccer. Um, the game is now at 6.30 in the morning. So it just keeps getting earlier and earlier. But people around here really like soccer, and they're up at that hour. So I'm getting up early, and uh, what I've noticed is um, as we play these games, you know, we find different fields to play on. And we were playing in a game recently where it was a baseball diamond. And it's a unique baseball diamond because it's turf on the infield, and then it's all grass on the outfield kind of unique. So two games going on at once. It was the only field we had. The game on the turf on the infield and the game on the real grass on the outfield. Now as the game started I looked at the other team and I thought okay this is gonna be a really even game. Uh, I was look, looking at the players and um, we got on the grass and the other team started to make some comments. One guy said uh, I haven't played on grass since I was a kid. And another person, it was, you know a young guy, said I've never, I never play on grass. And I was feeling really old school. I, I am officially old school, you know. And in Seattle, I guess you just don't play on grass that much. And then the next guy said, oh, this is so slow. Like when you pass the ball, it is so slow. Could you feel it building? And, and you know what the next guy said? My socks are getting wet. And the next guy said, yeah, mine are soaked. And this is what the other team's saying. It was game over. Amen? <laughs> I mean, before we even started, I'm thinking it's going to be a close game. It was 6 nothing like that. They were walking around defeated before we even started. You've got to be careful as a Christian. You're not walking around, yeah, and my socks are wet. 
perspective, defeated before it seems God's word doesn't say, oh, walk around defeated. That's your calling. It says more than conquerors through Jesus who loves us. I was just excited to plant some real grass. I thought it was a good deal, you know? So that's a really little thing in life, but a lot of times sports, it, it just, for me, I see life played out in those small stages. Here's a bigger one with perspective. Corey Ten Boom, go back to World War II, and Corey Ten Boom saw how many Jews were being killed, how sad it was, and she thought, we've got to do something. Perspective, that we can't stay passive and just watch this slaughter. We've got to do something. So their family opened up their home. It's estimated that their family saved 800 people. That's still a small number when you think of the Holocaust, but they did something. We can't do everything, but we can do something. You know, one person came up to them, even a pastor, came up to them and said, do you realize that if you take in that mom and her little child, you might be killed? And that's why a lot of people didn't take anyone in. And you know what the Ten Boom family response was? It would be an honor to die that way. Be an honor. Whole different perspective. And so they were uh, thrown into the, the prison camp, and um, they just said uh, throughout their experience in the camp, it was just the sounds of hell. The sounds of hell. And uh, as they were in those um, concentration camps, they managed to get one Bible. And so uh, Corey and the family would open up that Bible when the guards weren't around and start to share from the scripture. And because there was an international audience, they would share, and then someone else would translate in Polish, and someone else would translate in Russian, and all the different languages. And she said, those were the sounds of heaven, where next door it was the sounds of torture and hell. And I just thought, what a perspective to get one Bible and just to continue to encourage those around in the middle of the battle. Well, Corey lost her dad, right away in the concentration camp, lost her brother. Um, her sister Betsy was still alive and kept a grateful spirit, grateful versus grumbling. You know what Betsy said? Let's continue to thank God. Let's thank God for his word. Let's thank God for each other. Let's thank God we're still alive. And she said, let's thank God for the fleas. There were fleas everywhere in their barracks. And even Corey was like, come on, we're not thanking God for no fleas. These fleas are not a gift. It's like a plague, you know, is what she's thinking. And Betsy said, no, let's thank God for the fleas. And so Corey said, fine, God, we thank you for the fleas. You know what they look back on later? And Corey said, those fleas kept the guards out. Because all the women that were in there, the guards were coming in doing terrible things, but the guards didn't want to come in because there were so many fleas. So, wow, thank God for the fleas. Talk about a perspective and what they went through. So one of the cruelest guards who, you know, just tortured her family and tortured so many and was so ruthless, later on after the war, came to Jesus and, you know, sought out Corey. Corey welcomed him, forgave him, shook his hand, shook his hand. Perspective, perspective. There's so many things in life we can't control, the circumstances, but one thing we choose is our perspective. And when I look at Corey Ten Boom's life, I say, that's God's perspective. That's God's word. So whether you're on a soccer field or it's World War II or something in the middle, your workplace or your family, what is God's perspective and is that what you want? God wants to renew our minds, help us to walk through with our feelings and build up our faith so that we see life with his perspective. The take home is this. Choose your internal condition and your approach and your perspective. Choose it well because it will affect every relationship and endeavor that you're a part of. It'll affect every relationship and endeavor. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that as we look around and so many things are happening in our world and on the outside, you call us back to that place of being still, of abiding, of our minds in choosing to believe and dwell on what's true and right and noble and lovely. Lord, our feelings can be just an intense wave but you mature us and grow us and so that those feelings are even a blessing. And Lord, we navigate through that well. And God, for our faith, forgive us, God, when we just simply have a lack of faith, but we call it being realistic. 
but it's just a lack of faith. Forgive us, God, when we try to do everything ourselves instead of building up other people and inviting them in. And Father, help us to, uh, to make um, decisions that reject destructive thoughts and beliefs and instead receive your perspective. Your thoughts and your ways are higher than ours. Renew us, God, we pray. In Jesus' name, and God, we also pray if someone here doesn't know you yet, that the start of a relationship with you could happen today, Jesus, by that decision to follow, to put your trust in the one who died on the cross, who is buried and is risen, and pay the full price for your sins. Make that decision with him today. We pray this in your name. Amen.